Hello, Dream Team. We're back doing what we do best. Welcome along once again to the good, the bad, and the rugby. The Lord is alongside in your woolies. Hello. Fresh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. It's cold out there, peeps. It's cold um, out there. It's, um, stay safe. Stay classy. Uh, and just when we thought we were going to have a nice... We'd earmark this as a nice, relaxing, yeah. fun pod. Maybe a little Fancy 15, maybe a couple of tour stories, a couple yeah. of gags. A fun guest. A cup of tea. Instead... <laughs> Instead, this week, as we said, we thought we'd do something quite fun and quite relaxing. We had a couple of agenda setters recently, what with Eddie going, of course, and we've had a state of the game with uh, Bill Sweeney and Simon Massey Taylor. And actually, last week, we had a really juicy show all around where is Europe going. Uh, we thought we'd kick back, put our feet up, and, and put the kettle on. But last Thursday, well done. The RFU dropped a bomb, and then they dropped the tackle height. And then, well, I think all hell has broken loose in the ensuing days. A couple of stats for you because the legal tackle height will move from the shoulder line to the waistline from July the 1st and the game has gone into meltdown. So at the time of going to print... In so the community speak, game, this in is. In the community game. Yes, you're absolutely right. At the time of going to print, nearly 70,000 people have signed a petition saying, don't do it. Uh, I've just gone to check the Telegraph's online poll saying, should we lower the tackle height? Uh, 1,200 people have voted. 70% have said no, don't do it. And actually, when you were away, we spoke to uh, Bill Sweeney. He said, if, you, if, you, if you're tracking about 70-30 positive, you're doing all right. And unfortunately for Bill right now, it's 70-30 negative as far as the decisions that the RFU have put forward. Um, I think that, that, that goes for all in. That goes for all in. <laughs> You've just got to stay the course. I think it's fair to say that we thought Eddie Jones was polarising in terms of opinion. Right now, we've got um, we've got two very, very noisy camps, which makes this a... A lively show to do. Shall we put a little bit of nuance onto what we're going to do over the course of the next hour or so? So on the face of it, completely understand a lot of the reaction of grassroots players who are screaming and shouting about how preposterous this is. There are a lot of very loud voices in the media. Uh, there are a lot of people saying how idiotic the decision is. But the question at the heart of this has been posed by Ross Tucker, who we actually asked to come on the show. I think he's away bicycling at the moment, so we didn't manage to get him into the studio in time. But he is the man who has done the research which has been used as a key pillar on which the RFU's decisions have been made. And that what he is saying is that right now something has to be done about the safety and player welfare situation in rugby. That is the foremost reason for changing the tackle height. Away you go. <laughs> um... No, I, look, I'm, I probably sit with everyone else with, all the players that have come out and sort of said, why are we doing this? Um, I'll probably sit on that similar level because I think of it, how it affects everything at professional level rather than what we're, we are talking about. Obviously, reading Ross's sort of sum up yesterday, funnily enough, he says at one part, you know, dropping when we, they dropped it to Sternum Heights in the championship, they got more concussions because they didn't mitigate the fact that they needed to do something to the ball carrier to change his thoughts of when he was carrying into contact. So if he dropped body height whilst they were hitting at sternum level, your head, a lot of it is around your head sharing the same, you're both the ball carrier's head and the tackler's head sharing the same air space is, <laughs> is... I like the way you've put that. ...is what we're what the sort of nuances are of it. I get what they're trying to do. They've obviously looked at... The trials that France did, um, obviously, tragically, four four players died in France over a very short period. Yep. Over a very short period of time, and they needed to. They France wanted to make ch changes. Obviously, they were invested through the tragedies that were there, and just even though they had uproar and they had people disagreeing with it, they pushed on through it. Realistically, the drop in concussions from that trial is eight percent. Now I don't know what the the num I don't know what that puts in That's numbers. That's from Michael Ulwin's research. He has crunched the numbers, and has has uh, there's a whole raft of detail and data which I could read out, but I think in the interests of of sort of trying to keep this moving along at pace, you're absolutely right. Theoretically, the reduction in head injuries that we could expect. I'm reading this. Uh, it, and this is coupled with a scenario in which we never see another upright tackler again is theoretically 8%. But it is 8% in the right direction. 8% in the right direction. But I think there's an under... How they are, if you worded it for me, there's an underlying tone of trying to change the game. There's a lot of talk about evasion. And yet they haven't done what France has done, which put in a law for the ball carrier that he wasn't allowed to drop his body height. 
Well, it's yeah. I'm just trying to find the the the. Um... That was, so that was implemented in France. So yes. they put a law in to the game where um, a ball carrier isn't allowed to drop his his a bend from the hip and drop his body high, which yep. we haven't done. It will be encouraged, is what the RFU have said. Yes. Now then, who dictates? It's called a partner law change. I just, I just, I'm, I've got the detail in front of me. So let me just read it. Um, World Rugby readily approved the trial that took place in France, particularly when the French also proposed a creative and quite daring partner law change, in inverted commas, that would regulate the actions by the ball carrier. That is, they said that the ball carrier would not be permitted to drop their height into contact or to bend down and lead with the head. In their words, the defender must be able to tackle the ball carrier and so have access to his pelvis. Sorry for bringing the detail in, but I think yeah, it, so, it just, I'm, well, I'm taking this from what the RFU have the done is they got. haven't put that part in the law in. So the trial that they ran in the championship, it so players are going to be encouraged to be more evasive. Well, well, what does that even mean? What does that mean to a referee? First and foremost, if someone does drop, can they can a, a ball carrier be now penalised for not using too much evasion or bending too much? I, I don't. There's a lot of grey area there um i see how this could work in in lower community rugby uh, i think if you um just putting some stuff down if you look at the fact that line speed's not as fast so there isn't as much having to break off the line and get into someone's face before they catch the ball uh fitness levels aren't quite as strong so timing tight you get more time on the ball which allows you to be hopefully more evasive or move the ball. Obviously, skill sets also negate that in, in how, depending on the level of rugby. And then are people as brave in community rugby in terms of because they don't have that technique? Not all players will be solid on their technique. Not all players in the premiership are solid on their technique. Does that mean then they don't want that physical smash all the time and they're going to they're gonna go, they're going to make those tackles further? So... I'm not really sure. I think fundamentally this is a change of how they want to see the game played. They want more offloads. They don't want as many rooks. They don't want... And if you can enforce this law... Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I... Uh, it depends why it's being done. I think, you know... Well, just, just, no, I'll answer the question that, that you've put. Do, do you think rugby... I mean, I think this is really interesting. And I've got, I, what, what I want to ask you about is... I completely understand. I've got no agenda in this at yeah, all. Yeah. I, I'm... I mean, I can remember the days of playing age 8, 9, 10 when it wasn't a hit, it was a tackle and there was no reference. I always remember being told there's no reference to hits in rugby, et cetera, et cetera. And I can remember the days of accepting the tackle and rolling yeah. it back and cheek to cheek and all that kind of thing. The game has moved so dramatically in terms of the levels of physicality in the last 20 years or so. We are now seeing enormous problems arising in player welfare. We've also got a product but also, at the moment. You've also, I also got to put that in perspective, is we're looking for it. Well, of course we, we are. But, but, yes, yeah, but, that's, but that's, we, we haven't looked for it through the whole well, history of, uh, of rugby. Well, we sports, haven't sports science is, is, yes. is 20 years old, whereas rugby is 170 years old or whatever it is, 160 well, years old. Sports science in rugby is only 26 years old. Cause, yeah, that's what I mean. When, yeah. So it's, uh, but we, didn't, we wouldn't be looking, we haven't been looking for this until the last 10 years. Yes. So all the, you don't know, that say for the legal case that is coming, that has been put brought against the RFU, World Rugby, WRU and everything by professional players mm -hmm. for a period where no one was looking at this. Now they're saying that that's the RFU's fault, that's World Rugby's fault for not going into it. But every one of those players knew what they were getting into. It's a physical game. So I sit in two, I sit in two camps. They, you know, they're now using it's an evasion game. Yes, it is. But it is also whatever you say about it it is a contact sport and it's an unpredictable contact sport with split seconds decisions made at an unbelievable speed and things will always go wrong now do we embrace this is a fundamental point do we embrace that as a sport and that is what we are like boxing you get punched in the head so do we embrace what we are we are a physical game yes or okay. are we trying to fundamentally change the game to get people just to try and get more people to play the game and what the article that I read that you sent me, uh, where the guy's like, just so that more people will buy tickets to go watch elite level sport rather than. So what? Uh, this is this is my confusion by it. I actually, the more I read the statistics, I'm like, why wouldn't you try this? But then you read that article, and, he, and having played club rugby, uh, well, playing rugby for Minch and playing, 
you know, in all the games that I've played, which granted isn't a lot, probably 16 the f- my first year, I retired eight and it's been reducing numbers yeah. since, but I've probably played 30 games for Minch. I don't think I've seen anyone. I think I might, might have seen one person go off with a head knock, but it, it, it was probably from a breakdown rather than a, than a tackle. You know, most of the tackles are fine because the, the actual forces that are going in aren't what they are in in professional rugby. They're not the, not everyone's the, you'll get a few CrossFit noises out there. <laughs> Hello to all of you. You know who you are. Can I um, can I just can I just throw in then some of the layers that we we will hopefully try and get into, and it's worth saying as well that we are going to be joined a bit later on by John Lorne from the RFU, who is the head of game development, uh, and we'll hopefully have some of the answers as to not only what exactly the changes are, but how we have got to this point. And we're also going to be joined by a couple of old friends as well. So Paul Millen is the chairman of Aylesbury Rugby Football Club, which is where we went to do our play together, stay together game. We didn't have any yep. head knocks that day, did we? No. Uh, and James Buckland, of course, many of you will remember as a Leicester Tiger, and he is now the head of rugby at Aylesbury as well. So looking forward to hearing about how we've got to this point from an RFU's perspective and what those who are living the day-to-day expect the impact to be. But let me just come back to some of these theories, I suppose, um, and the layers to this debate. So you touched on litigation which I think is a huge part of this. Um, there is not only the... It's ob- heating up in here. I'm going to have to... Okay, yeah, we're now we're going to work. Yeah, you get yeah. undressed. While you're doing that, there's obviously this enormous um, uh, court case going on with the professional players. But on Thursday last week, it was also announced that there is now a class action from a group of 55 former amateur players. Um, and we've got lots I'm of information to, about that. Am I allowed to jump in on that? Please do. So I, re- I read that article and... They chose to highlight a fellow who's playing in that, and he has been concussed 18 times. Firstly, he doesn't have to play. It's an amateur sport, so he can stop whenever. So I'm not sure how he's blaming the game on this because he can, doesn't need to play. Right, but okay. he also was playing 80 games a season. And that's more than once a week. That is an impressive... Because so, he played both rugby union and rugby league. Yeah. I would never... Ha- who is... Who has recommended that playing 80 games a season is a good idea. No professional team ever does it, so no, he's not watching people who are playing 80 games. Yeah. And un, un, how can you, as an amateur sport where you don't have to turn up on a weekend, probably your mates are telling you after 18 concussions that you probably need to look after yourself. I think probably after six, your mates would be going, mate, it yeah. doesn't look doesn't good have you ever thought about this. So I, that's a really good point because there are a lot of people out there saying... I am a rugby player. It will be my decision as to whether I play and I take the risks associated with playing the sport. And I completely understand that argument. The flip side of that, though, is that can you actually genuinely have a governing body in charge of the sport in which they know about the health risks, but they turn a blind eye to them on the grounds that people have signed waivers? I mean, that is simply not responsible governance. But then who's doing that? Well, I'm not saying that they are, but I'm <laughs> saying that, that that is that is the suggestion of some people on social media. You, you could also flip the other say, side around and go, now, other sports like rugby league, you, you we're getting loads of vibes out of rugby league that they're looking to massively change their sport. They hit higher than we do. We have learned from rugby, rugby league, league in terms of how, uh, you know, Sean Edwards coming in, Kevin Sinfield targeting the ball and stopping offloads is the main point of rugby league. That has come into our game. Now, rugby league, you're not getting a lot of, or I'm certainly not aware of a lot of pushback coming from rugby league. And it's still the physical sport that it's always been. And it's accepted what it is, and it's comfortable in its own skin. We, I believe, as a rugby union, possibly, and this is no slight on rugby league players, but of a generally well, well-schooled, well well-background, are we pandering to a greater narrative of of we have to change the game because it's for the good of the game. Where I actually think it's ruining the game is my actual belief. But what, but sorry, what is ruining the game? Cha- cha- manipulate, changing law to protect the individual protect, player. Well, to not lessen the risk. To, to change the game, fundamentally change the game to a different game than what it is. A test match for me, playing England, is a test match. It's not supposed to be easy. That's why not everyone can do it. Obviously, the health of the people who are playing the game is important, but also the skill set within rugby is to learn that there are different tackles and try and execute them and get better at them. I think now people are less uh, 
technically advanced in the way that they tackle because of how defenses just fly up. So your timing is different. You don't get to place a lot of the time. You don't get to place people, and it's all about winning that game line. I would have liked to. Have, I would like to them to have pushed the push the uh, tackle line back, so people have to come gives the attackers more time. So you to would, actually you would put your sideline two meters behind the or, rock or play around with it. But then, on a caveat to that, Jamie George's tackle on the weekend and the other Saracen player who I'm sorry I've forgotten his name who got yellow carded were horrendous technique. And that's a that's you know, one of the best hookers in world rugby, and he still yeah. got it horribly wrong. So it's not going to say that it's always going to happen, but that is the, the whole point of a contact sport is sometimes you're going to get it wrong. So, so okay, so so the, the two points I've put forward there around players accepting the risk and signing up to it, the, the, the flip side of that being the governing body just simply not being able to accept that as a as a, a a rightful way to run the game knowing the knowing what they know. Are you are, are you saying therefore that players if they want to play rugby you've got to accept the risks sign up I, to it and I get on with it. Yeah, I definitely think there is some of that. What you want it to be a phys it's a physical sport in every nature. There is a, a dr there is a line in the sand moment for me where you've just got to go right. We've done everything you can and from my point of view you've taken away deliberate stuff majority of shoulder charges that were in you know the spear the tackles spear tackles taking uh, players in the air etc yeah, yeah you've taken you've mitigated that down to now what you're talking about is decisions made in split seconds whilst a lot of the time something might happen that you just physically can't react quick enough to do, to deal with because you're trying to you're worried about what's going on, on the outside there are so many decisions going on in rugby players brain now even saying within that a lot of the time, players still get it wrong when they don't need to be there. You know, I would say this in the England for the women's uh, World Cup final, that red card, she should never have even been there. There was no re her tackle choice was Lydia, completely Lydia wrong. Lydia Thompson, yeah. But that's got nothing to do with where the tackle height, the tackle height is. She knew she shouldn't be up there, but she was still up there. So what they're doing by putting it down to the waist level is they're saying, so if they get it wrong and they're a bit higher they'll be in that green zone, which they've called between your armpit and your waist. They'll be in the soft zone where there is very low risk of injury. And if they go lower, they'll be in an orange zone. Well, actually, we're talking, talking, we're tackling in an orange zone or whatever it is. So waistline, they're saying, is orange, which still means you will get head injuries. But if you go a bit higher, you'll be in the green zone. Whereas if you can set the green zone, if you go a bit higher, you'll be in the red zone. Can I, um, can I add to that? So Brian Moore's written a very good article in the Telegraph titled changes to tackle laws are import are more important, excuse me, than your social media outrage. And he makes the very interesting point here, much of this hyperbole might have been prevented if the RFU had concurrently announced the following, which I'm told will be done imminently. Number one, waste will mean navel, not top of the shorts. Although if you wear your shorts quite high, like I do, then that, those two come together. <laughs> uh, and if it's just above there, but definitely below the sternum, you will not be penalized. So there is, yeah, yeah, but, 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 let me go on. If the first tackle is legal, a secondary tackle below the sternum will be allowed. And number three, a bull carrier has an obligation under the current laws to not dip into a collision in a manner which endangers a would-be tackler. We're not talking about a couple of inches. When the bull carrier braces themselves for impact, but a sudden and drastic change in height which renders a potentially legal tackle illegal. Wait, well, well, no, 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 hit gone. But what does, it, what does that mean about Jonah Loma running over Mike Cat? Who's in the wrong there? Is Jonah Loma going to get penalised for being too aggressive and, and dropping his shoulder to bump him off? Um, this is the problem with everything. That, so you, you manipulate things to try and get an outcome, but then something that you haven't thought of then creates more problems, uh, yeah. which is what they, what, what they said with the, the championship trial. They didn't do they didn't do what the French did to change. Well, they didn't have the ball. They didn't prevent the ball carrier from dipping. From so a lot of the time they dipped and it went head on head. Why can't they just agree that actually creating better tackle technique and and this sort of information that is coming out, people are far more aware of what is a dangerous tackle, what is a safe tackle. Yes, they still happen. Now, will even going waste prevent this? Probably not. Because someone trying to go up people's footwork. Now I'm I'm always thinking the problem is with this. I'm always thinking about professionalism rather than amateur. Yeah. Where as I think uh, 
I would I wouldn't know if there's a stat on this, but I would think amateur tackles from everything I've seen are generally a lot lower, and they're obviously lower lower impact. And that guy who wrote the article that you sent to me said there isn't a, there isn't actually an issue in the game, which, yeah. which obviously then the 55 people who are who are suing the RFU, WIU, and World Rugby will will have a have a different point of view on that. Yeah. But then if all of them got concussed 18 times. Uh, yeah. yeah who's 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 the fool, who's the fool in some respects and that's not nothing against that fellow he obviously loved his rugby so we'll, we'll come on to this because what we'll do is we'll get into the, the the detail of the the sort of the club's reaction and the rfu's uh sort of views on how we've got this point as we've said i just want to bring in some of the well i suppose that the feedback that has come from the french trial okay so th this is this law that we're now having of, of tackle height being reduced to the naval is now not only taking place in france but also in new zealand and i understand that it's probably going to be rolled out in other territories in the not too distant future wales ireland scotland etc and possibly even all the way up to world rugby so these are some of the outputs from a conversation between the rfu and the french rugby in terms of the feedback to what France has learned since bringing in um, this new directive. So the reduction in tackle height laws was in direct response, as you mentioned, Mike, to the tragic deaths of four young players in the community game in 2019. It was explained to the game that change was coming, but there was no prior widespread consultation with the clubs. That came after the decision was taken. So they changed and then they did the, 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 the explanation. It's impacting 80% of the clubs in France. It was a very difficult start said uh, those running the French game, slightly confused by COVID as well, but after two full years of implementation, there is no further discussion on the topic. So it's been bedded in, they're off and running again. They have recently looked at 50 games and compared pre and post rates of head impacts, concussion, yellow cards, and they say that the numbers are vastly reduced. There is further specific quantitative data on its way. Player welfare and safety was the initial priority, but the behavior of the ball carrier has changed, resulting in more offloads and a more attacking, faster game. They've continued educational meetings with referees to implement the changes. Initially, there was an increase in penalties, but players and coaches have adapted. There are now no double tacklers, which opens the game up more. Why are there no double tacklers? Is don't that law as well? Don't have the answer to that. A ball carrier dipping into the tackler is penalised. If in the attempt of scoring a try, a player dives over the line and a try is scored, then the try stands... But if the player dives and is unsuccessful, a penalty is given against the attacking player. Right. What happens in pick and goes? Don't, don't ask silly questions at this point. I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> a couple of bits which I think are really interesting. They are seeing a significant improvement in tackling technique and 70% of clubs have increased tackle coaching. In summary, uh, the French are 100% satisfied with the initiative. They have reduced injury rates and created a better game with more continuity interestingly player numbers are up 12.3 percent since the trial since this became law i'm not for a moment suggesting that that 12 percent growth in player numbers is down solely to this they've got hey, a yeah. world cup and they're winning grand slams but yeah, apparently it is a better game to which yeah, more so people are attracted. so that's that's my thing is this an actual concussion move or is this a, a game to a, a place to increase participation and make our game but more open to diversity and does it matter the well, game has got so many problems yeah, at the moment but, but i don't so this is this is where i'm stuck on my points so you know speaking to danny grucock briefly on saturday who i saw who is um he ca he's coaches at bristol academy but he also does clifton school he's not sure about what that evasiveness means is our our players going to be penalized if they're not evasive enough so if you just run straight even if you, and and dip a little bit are you going to be punished for not being evasive enough if someone tackles low can anyone but stop the ball from offloading it or are we just now going well hey you you just how, know you can offload how it'd do be you like playing jonah lomu yeah. like playing jonah lomu rugby on the playstation just offload every time and no one can defend it is yeah. that also what you want to see is that what we want to see do we not want to see any physicality in the game anymore so I, these are the fundamental points yeah. of uh, what i'm trying to get across is what is where is rugby union pinning it's where is it pinning the flag or whatever where is it to the where is it so sticking I don't know the answer mass? to that I mean I have a clue you know test matches became test matches because of what they were they are, they are physical competition at every facet of the game that was my why I love rugby union is because every single facet of that game is supposed to be a competition 
breakdown, malls, lineouts, high balls, Rocks, restarts, scrums, scrums. Are you now saying that if you lower them and it's it's always your arms are always going to be free and you can always be evasive, you can always offload. That's not that's not really a, a competition. It's not one man versus the other man who can do the best, who can come out best on top of that tackle situation. It's not anymore. No, nope, the attacker agree. is always then favoured. You know, he, the, where does that then lead to? People who are trying to steal balls, jackal balls. Are you going to say, well, now you can't be in that position because someone's going to have to drop that height? And you know, in, in my opinion, probably where most people have head knocks that don't even get seen. I would be far more interested in finding out first what is the what is classed as a a concussive blow. What do can we put values on it? Can we then monitor it? Can we figure out where we're going with it before? Push just pushing everyone to waste tackling. I think it will. I think I actually think it will work in the in in the community game for the reasons I've said. I think the people the people who are playing the game. Um, I think it often ends up there. You know, the the less the lower you go down the rank, the less people want to make that collision, if you want to use that word, or the dominant tackle. They want they absorb more. Um, you know, fundamentally, also funny to say that the, because we, the way we wrote the law, which I think a lot of the problem sits in is the way it's delivered. Um, you know, when we changed that you had to be l lower the height so that when those old hits of where someone really lowered themselves and they into the tackler's gut and then you got pulled down, you sort of smother tackled and then went down and tried to steal the ball. They've stopped now because everyone's too worried about being upright when they make a tackle even if the ball carry runs into them. So now people try and drop and you create more concussions. So when you sometimes when you manipulate laws or you or not manipulate when you bring in new things, it actually has the the alternate the alternate effect. The law of unintended consequences. Now if you put this if you, so my worry is I'm sort of with you. I'm not really sure where I sit on this. My brain all my passion and everything for rugby is telling me this is not a good idea, but I'm also sitting in the camp of Reading that, reading what uh, Brian Moore said, more offloads, more tries, is that what we want? But then that's accepting that we're fundamentally not going to live rugby how it is. The test match isn't going to be the same. What, but I suppose on that, what you would say is that predominantly most of the metrics in rugby at the moment are heading the wrong way. Player numbers, I and mean, we're down from 300 to 170,000 in, yeah. in the UK. There are, there are players walking away from the game in their droves. So Already. on that, I think I read I read a few things on social media about people who have left the game. He goes, well, I was thinking about coming back. There's no chance I'm coming back now. RFU, we did something for you. Play around, together, play stay together. together. Stay together. Game on rules. Bringing people back to the game. People who've been out the game aren't that fit, aren't going to, don't feel comfortable in their tackle technique. And now you're telling them they've got, maybe they can't even bend over that low to make a waste tackle if someone runs straight at them even though depending on their variance of, of evasion ability that they're supposed to be using. And they, they do run straight at you, even if they run upright. Some people can't get down that low <laughs> and don't really want to. A few lads I've seen have got beer bellies that big that they can't bend that low. Right. So what do you do then? So do they just leave the game? It's Whilst, really look, difficult. It's, it it's is, obvious, this is, yeah. this is yeah. I so, think, one of the most difficult shows we've done because yeah, there is because, a very yeah. valid... And very uh, vociferous and I'm, and argument I'm, on the left and, I, and exactly and I the same on the right. I keep, I, I've thought about this way, way more than what I thought I would over the weekend and everything else. And reading everyone's sort of chirping in comments, you want to see a faster game. You want to see a game with more ball time in play. So these are what generally a fan would want to yeah. see. I, I, think, I think I'm right in saying it was 32 minutes ball in play, England, South Africa in November. Yeah. But, but, also, but also doing this, you could end up having shitload more scrums. Why? You want know, people dropping the ball in, ta in waste tackles, spilling it, offloads going wrong. You could end up with just yeah. as many scrums. It doesn't, you know, you're talking, this is community rugby. It's already, I suppose there's a load of scrums anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But um, yeah, I can, I sit on one side where I could see it could be really nice, positive, a build for a young player, build their athletic ability, avoiding people keeping two hands on their ball, uh, on the balls, <laughs> keeping two hands on the ball, uh, running and looking for offloads because they know they don't have to worry about getting wiped out from one way or the other. Um, then if you put it in a professional situation and people's tackle technique, the athletes are so good at professional rugby now that if you, if you implemented it and you're trying, the fundamental for a tackle is to be as close as, 
if you want to be able to make an effective tackle, you have to be as close to that person before you drop your body height. Yep. Whereas if you are going for waist, especially when it's in a quite close combat area, is very hard to do. You know, I was a outside centre who made his living on wide tackles, which were always around the waist. The technique was to to do that sort of dive tackle, swing your legs around the ball, you'd be straight over the top of the ball. That now isn't the usual tackle. 13s are flying straight up, trying to cut things off, which then doesn't put you in that but situation. But they that in the community game. They're trundling up as quickly no, as they can. No, I got there as not. quick as I could, Rev. No, no, I'm, I'm t- comparing. Some still try and fly up, but then in that same space, some fly up, some don't. So the pass is on anyway. Yeah. And then you can do it now, whether you've then got, this, depending on what level you're playing at, is do you have the skill set to do that? But defense is the easiest thing to do because it doesn't really involve skill in terms of organization. Fit, it just involves getting in a line, organ- talking. It's not an actual skill. It's one of those things that coaches said that, yeah, you don't, you know, you don't need skill to do it. You just need energy and you need to be able to, and will to do it. Mm. Um, so that's not going to change, which is why I said if you gave pe- the attackers more time, by te- dropping the, the offside yeah, line back yeah, because two meters. We never see people get done for offside, even in the in the professional game. When a lot of the time you go, nah, it's borderline. Hmm. I would, you know, give people more time. They wouldn't be able to fly up all the time. Do you think you've just fixed the problem? Well, no, I don't. I'm, because then the nature of professional sport, you'd find a way of getting, getting around it. But can, the, the can whole I just point ask is, you, that- you can be more evasive, and you can be if you have more time. And the biggest thing that you test matches, you get less time. Yep. So, and the higher up you go, people are better and more organized. And then, and that is the problem. So, you know, I would have said first and foremost was, you know, pulling that, p- pulling that defensive line back would be a better thing because it would make things, it would maybe slow people's approach to going up and hitting people. And then you would, you would naturally, be playing around and be more out the back. Now on those out the back ones, you know, all those tackles are nice. Nice side on tackle. Yeah. But it's a choice it's a choice. You know, I thought the day that we brought the seatbelt tackle in is a bad tackle. I use a seatbelt tackle all the time when I was playing. No one ever got I don't think well, I haven't seen anyone get concussed from a seatbelt tackle yet. Now you're not allowed to use it. Really effective tackle of ba- of base C making a, a good tackle whilst also being able to s- Stop, stop the, the offload. Stop. Oh yeah, stop the offload and the forward momentum at quite a quick rate, and be able to then spin and get back on your feet to compete. But we can't do that anymore. So now you've got to dive at someone from behind. If you miss, you slide down and you get flicked in the face, kicked in the face. I tell you, he's going to the potting shed to get his boots out. Joe Worsley. <laughs> <laughs> Time for the big Joe to come but, back. You know, talking to Hask, Hask is quite in favour of it because that's how he tackled. But then Hask and Worsley's tackle technique was great, but Worsley got. I mean, he he's got a skull as as thick as an iron bar. So, you know, he he walked into knees a lot of the time, but he still managed to get up. Yeah. But yeah, he he was a he was great at cutting people in two. But that tackle shouldn't have gone. Dan Lydia's as well. But I'd also say that I'd also say that Joe operated in a in a time where that flying up wasn't what it is today. You know, even though they played, uh, you know, the first press defense that they ever did, I don't know whether it was as fast as what it, what it goes up as today. Let's bring in our guests in just one moment. I just quickly want to ask you the question that you've posed three or four times now, because I think that does provide quite an interesting framework for where we're trying to go with this. You keep saying, "Does rugby need to change? Does it? Does the game need to? Are we are we thinking about a sport that has to speed itself up? Or well, fundamentally, does it need to become wider and easier to play so that?" more people play it so you're asking more questions again but what, what is your view on the state of the game at this point in time <laughs> well it, yeah the problem is i'm sitting on the fence here a little bit because i don't want the game to change i want it to be what it is people to learn the skill sets of even though it's racked with challenges at the moment of course yeah of course it is but then uh, are we saying that this is going to solve all problems it's not going to have any uh, as you say it's only going to drop realistically Eight percent, eight percent. But then, participation is up twelve percent. Is that continually going to grow? I think we're at a very early age of of what we're trying to do, and I just. But feel do, do you therefore? But okay, so different question. Do you agree that the game has to do something? Honestly, but no. I think it. I think people have to get better at 
what they're doing. I think that a lot of the high shots that are red cars now are completely so players' fault. Think community game again. Oh, numbers are shelling from three hundred to one hundred and seventy in three years. <laughs> yes, but they're People showing because of with... COVID, majority yes, okay, wise. Yeah, but yes, but that, and they're, and they're also shelling because of this of the talk of the media of the media around this and parents going, well, do it. Oh, young mums. Exactly. Yeah, but there then, is so but, much noise around the negative yeah. health impact of playing rugby at the moment. Does the game need to do something to be seen to be trying to address that? To an extent, yeah, I think it does. Is this going too far? I think so. So, it, it, so what's mine, the happy medium? I, pff, well, the happy medium is, it, was this a problem in the community rugby? What's the, what's the data on that? Do we have any? Yes, so I've got I've got a whole raft because, of data. Because okay, the, all so those all those games that they've made this decision on are p elite so level games. I will they? read because it's quite lengthy. So this comes from the article by Michael Alwyn, who we've referenced already, who has worked out the best case scenario is an eight percent reduction in concussions. He goes on to call the new measures unworkable. Um, he's got a very interesting uh, sort of paragraph all about the demonization of the tackler and where rugby's going. We're still sending players off six years on, not because they're delinquent lunatics who must be punished, but because some situations are impossible to avoid rely reliably in such a fast but moving then I sport. Also, I think he's probably talking about professional sports. He is as there. Well. Almost exactly four years ago, the RFU cut short a trial in the Championship Cup. Yes. That trial saw the threshold for a high tackle to move to the armpit line. Uh, Nigel Melva had some stuff to say, which was sort of not terribly committed. Uh, data shows the first objective of lowering tackle heights was achieved. There was a 24% decrease in all tackles where contact was made by the tackler above the ball carrier's armpit line. So in general, tr the trend came down. There was a 25% decrease in tackles where contact was made above the armpit line by an upright tackler on an upright ball carrier. Is this useful? No, you're sending me to sleep. No, it has to be useful yeah, but you've got to get into it though. Yeah, yeah, it's 41% decrease in the number of tackles where contact was made with the head or neck of the ball carrier. So that's the key one. Let me give you that again. The data from the trial that took place in the Championship Cup in almost four years ago showed there was a 41% decrease in the number of tackles where contact was made with the head or neck of the ball carrier. When they lowered it to the armpit. When they lowered it to the armpit, correct. So that is a fairly significant... But the concussion rate went up. I think possibly because the, <laughs> because the ball carrier didn't was dip. dipping. Yeah, yeah. The, the carriers didn't dip. Ross Tucker, who we've referenced already, says the premise of the championship trial was to lower the height to the sternum. You'll recall that in our 2016 meeting, the expert rugby group had suggested trials that lowered height outside of the top level of rugby, and the RFU embarked on this one in 2017 because there was already a feeling that the sanction-driven changes in the elite game were not producing the desired results. One thing I would say, Tins, is we've got a lot of questions here. So why don't we bring in our guests at this point and say a very warm welcome to John Lorne, who is the head of game development at the RFU, and two old friends, Paul Millam, who's the chairman of Aylesbury Rugby Club, and James Buckland, ex of Leicester Tigers, of course, who's the head of rugby at Aylesbury. Welcome to all of you. Uh, it's quite a lively topic. John, I'm going to come to you first of all. Um, well done and thank you for being the man to put his head above the parapet from all things RFU. I imagine it's been a fairly lively few days, first and foremost. How are we feeling about this announcement and about, I suppose, the reaction to it? 70% in the Telegraph's online poll saying, please don't do it. Um, give us a sense of what the water temperature has been like at RFU Towers over the last few days. It's fair to say that the reaction has been very strong. Uh, quite a lot of emotion around strong feeling but putting that to one side I think we still believe it's it's the right thing to do really focus on player welfare um, not just now but in the future as well. Tell us um, a little bit just about your role because when I say head of game development what, what does that actually mean what is your involvement in the decision and the process that's been uh, revealed? Yeah so um, my role very much is around um, looking looking at the community game in terms of how we support coaches, referees, um, uh, things like pitch side care as well, um, and how we um, support community rugby players more, more broadly. In terms of this decision, I, I was involved in pulling together um, some of the options for the RFU Council to consider, along with other colleagues, 
Um, and then obviously you, you put those forward to council and they make their decisions. Um, we have done a lot of research into this. We've got pages and pages of data and notes and views and, and contrasting opinions. Can you just give me the headlines, I suppose, from your perspective as to why this is the right decision? What are the numbers and the trials uh, and the outputs that you have used to get to this point? Yeah, I think we've looked at, uh, at three main areas, really. Um, going back to sort of 2015, 2016, uh, it's a combination of world uh, research um, and it's stuff that we've also done in this country. So if I go back, there's been the, the championship trial that was run in 2019, I think it was, over here. Um, there's the Stellenbosch trial that's taken place recently and there's the French uh, French valuation of their lower tackle height as well. And we've used all of those plus our recent change in the age grade game where we lowered the lowered the height of the tackle to the armpit. Uh, and where we've been where we've been influenced is that higher height body tackles with an upright ball carrier, sorry, and an upright tackler at speed, they're responsible for significantly more head acceleration events and obviously potentially concussions. So, John, a lot of the feedback that you read in the report by Ross and was all based around what's happening in the elite game. Did, did were any, and then what you read online is everyone saying that they don't playing in the community game doesn't have these issues. They haven't seen it yet. We're in, we're forcing these new laws onto them. They don't want it. They want they don't see there's a problem. Is there any record of what are the the concussion numbers are like in in the grassroots community game? Yeah, obviously there are concussions in the community game and, and the numbers tend to differ by level, Mike. Um, so if you looked at, for example, a game in National 1, which is the top end of the community game, you, you might expect to see a concussion one every eight games. And obviously at different levels, that may be more like one in every 15 games. Um, in the age grade game, it tends to be around that one in seven, one in eight in the under 18 boys. Um, so it, it, it varies across across the different levels of the community game. Um, but yeah, con concussions do happen in the community game. And I think um, one of the big challenges that the sport has faced for a while is it's, it, it's that fear of concussion as well, which has often dominated the headlines. Oh, I mean, th this was my my point having read every everything and my my instinct always goes back to the to the professional game which is just because that's where i spent the majority of my life and then but i would say i've played you know 30 local rugby games for minchin hampton since and i don't i think i might have seen one uh, concussion in there and i obviously then there are varying degrees this is also the problem like national one is is way better than what minchin hampton's player so the athletes will definitely be better they'll train differently techniques skill sets are obviously going to be better so yeah, there is a floating scale within this but i think that is what's frustrating everyone is you i is the problem that is seen at elite level is being passed on to the lower levels without actually where that might not be the necessarily the problem so is this more about concussion or is it more about trying to change the game to allow people who don't want to play because they're thinking of everything that's been negative in the papers about concussion and it's trying to uh, alleviate that to allow a greater participation sport i think i think fundamentally it's about reducing the, the risk of concussion or the number of concussions I, I believe that there could be some secondary benefits from from this which which could be the game might become slightly more fluid um in terms of offloads passes movement etc um but that that would be a secondary benefit i believe uh, and that that may take time to emerge mike uh, you know as as players and teams become become used to the changes and as, and it's predominantly this is a this is to alleviate head injuries in rugby that is why these decisions are being made first and foremost absolutely and there is a scientific um there is scientific proof that making these changes will reduce head injuries but at the moment there are no targets or numbers as to as to by how much that's correct yeah okay that's really helpful thank you john you've, you've laid that out very well for us um thank you for for sitting and waiting paul and james paul i'm going to come to you first of all um as chairman of aylesbury rfc what is your reaction to the uh, announcement from the rfu last week there's a couple of reactions for, from our, my point of view um primarily it's a fundamental change to the game um 
that I don't think is is workable. Uh, that's based on my perception of what we've been told it's going to be at the moment. There may be more detail that, that maybe changes that. But at the minute, it, it, certainly talking to players and refs at our club, um, the refs aren't really sure how they're going to ref it. The players don't really want to play it. Uh, and that's not the, you know, that's not the, the third team players. That's across the, 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 the pitcher. Uh, and certainly including some of our senior first team players. Uh, we lose them from the game um, from their understanding of what, what it's changing to. Um, and more than that, the, the lack of consultation. Um, there just seems to be, have been, no, I haven't been asked anything. I saw, I saw a piece come out uh, a few weeks ago that suggested this was going to happen, which I... I sort of share with the players, and the reaction was very much <laughs> as if as if that would happen. Um, and, and now we're here, and it's been decided, and that's it. We've done. And as far as I know, no club has been approached or or asked what they think of it, uh, or get presented with the evidence uh, that this is being based on. Okay, and James, the same question to you, really. I mean, head of rugby at Aylesbury, you've been to the very top of the game. Um, tell us your view on it from a coach's perspective, and what your senior players are saying to you. Oh, mate, I, I mean, I've been in the game for 35 years um, as a as a as a junior, mini junior player, a pro player, and then back into coaching, and then back into amateur playing again. The game, the I honestly believe the game's as safe now as it's ever been. Um, I think I think the new rules they brought in recently, with in regards to head contact and the sanctions around it. Um, I mean, my, my feeling before these other before we were throwing the bombshell last week was let's give that chance to bed in because. The stuff around concussion and everything else at the, at the community at the community end seems to be taken a lot more seriously, in my opinion, than than, than the professional end. Um, you know, players aren't under pressure to play, so they're already really well protected. Um, the questions are, I've, I've just got so many questions because we keep hearing about all these stats and we're talking about reducing head-on-head -head concussions, but at the same time, we're talking about reducing the overall concussion rate as well because, I mean, I... I I've been concussed through head on head, but I've also been concussed pretty, pretty well from knee on head as well. Um, and at, at first glance, it looks to me like we're taking, we're doing the best we can to take the risk away from the attacking players. But now we seem to be placing a lot more risk on the defending players by forcing their tackle choice. There's a, there's a well-known saying in rugby that if you can't explain it clearly enough, then you don't understand it well enough. And it, it's just not clear. It's just not clear why, why the change is being made and, and what the reduction, what we're looking to achieve from the changes. But there, there is something with, within this that we've just talked about before we came on in the fact that, yes, it says waistline, but then if you get more into it, um, it's actually, if you go up to the navel, then still that's all, all fine. Well, well, let's bring... Let's mate, the, <laughs> mate, the community game, navels are at different... Mate, what's the ref going to go around pulling up people's shirts before the game, checking so, people's navels? Let, let me bring in John at this point, because I suppose that, that there are two questions, really, which is that this has fallen from the skies, John, and there have been headlines written and a lot of reaction. I, I suppose these things are never easy to break to the rugby public, maybe one or two regrets in that regard. Is there considerably more information that is going to be released now as to what these directives, uh, I suppose, the finer points of them and how they are going to be implemented and, and, and refereed? Y yes, there is. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share a little bit with, with James and Paul and, and, and yourselves now. The announcement was was waste and, waste and below. And we, we had still to define what we meant by waste. Where, where we're at at the moment is, you know, the waste will be defined as the area between, if you can imagine, the line of the navel um, and, and the line of the sternum. So it's that what you might call the midriff area or the, or, the, or the tummy or the stomach area. So that will be an area where, you know, players will still be able to make contact and make tackles in that area. Um, obviously, what we're keen to do is try and keep two heads out of the same airspace and avoid those those upright tackles around around the sternum and higher, certainly above the sternum, should I say. What about more than one tackler involved in a tackle, I mean, we you hear and you see a lot. Is is there other directives around that? How many people can actually compete at? Yeah, there's no there's no intention there's no intention to make it a one person tackle. We believe that by preserving the area above the waist up to the line of the sternum, it gives the area of the thighs and and that area above the waistband as a, you know as a target area for two tacklers. Right, can, uh, but you are then, uh, yeah, by the nature of that, you are then throwing the two defenders' head into the same airspace. You're also, you're, Tins, you're also sending more than one player into the offload space as well. 
um, looking for a split second offload. And those both attacking and defending players are going to be upright in that space. And the reality at the community end of the game is, whilst the directives are trying to encourage more attempted offloads, we all know that's just going to lead to more scrums. Um, which is something else. Happy, James. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm over the moon. I've like, played for another well. 10 years. <laughs> and, and, and the reality is, like, we've just had a, no, a load of new rules come in to try and take scrums out of the game. And now we've brought in another set of rules, which I tell you now, are going to lead to another 10 to 15 scrums every game. Do you have a response to that, John? I mean, has there been any sort of work around the unintended consequences of this? Do you know how the game is going to change when you lower the tackle height to below the navel? We've got the experience uh, from, from France where they introduced a, a lower tackle height in 2019. Uh, they were slightly different to us in that they made it a single person tackle. Um, what they've seen and what they've told us is that they've, they've seen after an initial period of, um, shall we say, embedding, and they've seen increased number of passes, offloads, line breaks, and a slight reduction in tackles and rooks as a result, because obviously the ball's in play more often, so it's become more fluid. Okay. Can I ask you about the ball carrier in this as well? Because I think you're, I'm right in saying that in the, um, in the, uh, the, the changes that were made in France, excuse me, it was actually what is known as, uh, what is it? A partner law. A partner law. So the ball carrier was not allowed to dip into the tackle at any point, but that's only a, a sort of guidance under these RFU directives. Is that right? Or is that, is that very some, much part of some more of this? detail coming around that. Yeah, yes, there is. I, I mean, fundamentally, I suppose I want to try and reassure, we don't want to deprive the ball carrier um, of the ability to, to brace for contact or to change their body height. Um, and under current law, the ball carrier does have obligations and responsibilities. So, you know, the ball carrier will be able to dip and carry the ball low. But in doing so, they, they do have a responsibility not to... Um, I guess initiate the the head contact with the with the tackler. Yeah, refereeing's hard enough. Community refereeing is even harder in a lot of cases. Um, how are they going to make the judgment on a what's the right tackle height? B what's what's the right ball carrier height that's not pushing it too low? Um, and then even if you do make a dominant tackle at that low waist height, you could easily, if you catch a person in the right way, his legs are going to go flying in the air, he's going to land on his head, and then it's going to be a spear tackle. So I, so I, I just feel that there's a lot of grey area that needs really filling to satisfy, you know, James and Paul's you know, concerns. Uh, yeah, concerns. You've got, you've, got a more rec you've got a more recent clip than that, Tins. You've got the tour saver chap. Have you seen that clip where he sat down those lads on the edge? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the students are watching that at college today and they're like, that's amazing. I just want to go and get a ball in my hands and start sitting people down. Yeah. And yet that, that, that would be a red card now. So this, so this and that's is, the game. This is a, this is a conversation that myself and Alex were going around in circles about before. And John, I don't know whether you've got an opinion on it. Are we fundamentally trying to change what rugby is to appease what is this the the 2023 narrative of... Uh, everything's got to be health and safety driven. You know, it's like asking a boxer not to punch as hard. It's like asking an M MMA fighter you can you can only leg kick to the sternum, you can't kick to the head. Um, rugby is a as much as you might want to say it's an evasion sport. It's a collision based sport, an unpredictable collision based sport where you can't control every moment of it, and there's been there has been demonstrations of when we've tried to mess around with things and we've dropped it with, you know, the championship uh, trial for starters where they did drop it to armpit height led to more concussions and it had to be abandoned. Are we, I feel that the whole point around health and safety was to make it that the genuine red cards for malice um, and being stupid were gone, which I think we have done now rugby. And I've been part of it for pretty much all its professional uh, time, rug, uh, uh, the skill set is to learn the n numerous different ways of tackling. That would be around the legs. It'll also be when you're not in a position to do that, still being able to drop and hit. Now, I, I agree that players don't get it right all the time and there are going to be mistakes, but I don't think that level of malice that used to be there where people just went with no tackle technique, I think that's all gone. And I, 
I feel we're getting to a point where we have to draw a line in the stand of what rugby is. Is that something that will ever happen or do you think it's always got to be just made purely of looking at you? Because I don't think you're never going to eradicate concussion in the game. So where do we draw the line that we're, we're doing too much to the game and a test match is no longer a test match? I think you've asked a number of questions there, but I'll, I'll try and start with the first one. Rugby, we have, to, we have to be upfront about this, Mike, you're right. Rugby will always have an element of... Um, of physicality around it, and, and so it should. You know that that's what makes it so so exciting for people. Um, we're genuinely this change. We're we're trying to find ways to make the game, uh, uh, you know, safer. And if we can reduce concussions by three four percent, brilliant. It, it's going in the right direction. But with this change, we've tried to retain the effort, essence of what rugby is all about. You know, we want players to go forward and carry the ball forward. We we want players to make aggressive tackles. But we, we really want to focus on this front-on tackle and just through this experimental law variation, see if we can make a dint in the number of the number of concussions that, that, that players may be suffering as a result of these type of tackles. Here's a question for you, James. Obviously, it's been run in France and it has had, uh, it's had a 12.3% uh, player increase. Yeah, player in increase time. and also reduced uh, the level of, of concussions. Is it the fact that we might have to try it to prove it right or wrong? Or do you think that would you'd lose too many players too quickly to even bother trying it? Listen, mate, I've played rugby all my life. I'm not going to run away from the game, but I do think you're going to lose a load of players off the back of this. I do. I think, And I think the people that are going to be most challenged are the coaches and the referees as well. I think, I think the referees have already had enough. Um, you know, you've got community referees having to coach scrums from all angles, malls from all angles, breakdowns from all angles, and now you're asking them to go around and measure people's navels as well. I just, I don't, I want the game to be as safe as it possibly can be, but I don't want it to be at the point where it's not rugby. If I can come in, it's, it's the sudden nature of this as well. The, to, to give the RSU some credit, they've, they've done some really good work on evolving all this head stuff. Head case came in, I can't, I'm not sure, probably about 10 years ago, I think. It was adopted by pretty much every rugby club I've spoken to, certainly by us. So every player, we've got just under 700 players at our club. They all work through the head case protocol. All our coaches take the head case um, online test and, and qualify that way. We run all our senior players and junior players without any incident of concussion, uh, which doesn't happen as regularly as people may think. Uh, they go through the return to play protocol through our physios and our, you know, if any, anybody tries to bring it back too soon, they're stopped. So this evolution of the game and the, and the issues with concussion has been excellent, I think. The RFU have done it really well. So why we are now here where, you know, I, I don't think we can get to where this new law would take us, but to evolve to it and, and to work with it and to work with us on it, I think would be much healthier than us sitting here now saying, asking all these questions, some of which can't be answered yet. John, can I can I ask you a couple of questions around suppose, some of the practicalities? I mean, how are teams expected to fend the ruck on their own line under these directives? I guess we've got to try and separate out different types of tackles in different types of situation. So uh, those those scenarios, those pick and go scenarios around their own line, obviously, the the both the ball carrier and the defender are often bent over in that situation. Yeah. Um, and so crucially as well in terms of how that might be refereed, any any head contact in those situations is generally of a lower force and a lower impact. Um, so the risk of concussion is obviously decreased. So why, just out of interest, why? Because ultimately you can quote the French uh, success of their, t their tests continuously, but we're not doing the same thing as them. So what makes it think that it's going to have the same success when we're going to still be able to have two men tackles? They're all going, they're going to have to tackle at the same height, so they're going to be in the same headspace from a two man tackle point of view. The ball carrier is still allowed to drop his body height, so you're still going to be bringing now his shoulder or his elbow into the tackle height of the defender. So there, whilst you're solving one problem because you haven't adopted the whole thing that france has done which has been proven you're still a little bit of guesswork but you're taking the the best bit of it and saying this is going to happen but you haven't taken the whole thing does that make sense yeah i'm with you I, I don't think i said that the ball carrier couldn't drop i said what we what we're looking to do is not to deprive the ball carrier of that opportunity but 
clearly if they drop their body height in a certain way, that may lead to sanction. What do you make of the scenario that you are in right here, right now? There's obviously a lot that has gone into making these changes, and yet those playing the sport, are, are 70% of them are rejecting them. I'm just interested as to, is the, is the dialogue going to reopen around this, do you think, John? Or is this just going to be driven through regardless of what those on the shop floor are saying? They wanted to make the decision early, so further engagement could take place with the game. Um, and clearly one of the one of the things that we were very keen to establish over the next eight months before next season is is that that training and support out to the game to coaches to referees and to players which would allow the changes then to hopefully be embedded in the best way possible before the start of next season and, and some of the detail that i've not been able to share with you tonight that will be and is being developed at the moment so there will be no doubt some consultation with with people like James and Paul and others about exactly what it is that they're looking for from the RFU um, to give them the best chances of helping us embed this in the game. I I just feel it's been delivered poorly. I know, as John, I know it's not your 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 place to deliver it. I feel it's been delivered poorly by the RFU, and it's made for the wrong headlines whereas they could have put far more detail in when they took when they talked about what they were trying to do which might have got James and Paul to come back and go okay let's let's see if we can work and and help you out what do you think Paul and James in terms of do you think if this gets pushed through and they can explain it right are you are you prepared to give it a go for the for what they would say is the good of the game, good of the I, game? Th I think I, th I think I don't want to speak for Paul but I think um we need to understand what the bigger vision is. Like, where's where's the RFU trying to take the game? I think there's been a couple of things that have riled people up. It's the fact that we feel that this this has been dropped on us without consultation. It hasn't been explained very clearly. I mean, Tins, to be fair, you're you're the first person to explain it that clearly to me. Um, uh, and you don't work for the RFU, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> no, I'm not um, sure they'll let me work for that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, we're angling, but not yet. <laughs> the main problem being. You know, I asked someone from the RFU, uh, I was having a conversation with someone for the RFU and they, they watched our game from a couple of weeks ago. And they said to me that under the under the present rulings, we only had two tackles that would have been deemed to be uh, unfair or, or should have been penalised. Um, and I, But the whole thing for me is it, the referees now are going to be under so much more pressure um, from, a, from a refereeing perspective, from a playing perspective, and from a coaching perspective, at the minute, it's defensively, you do not target anyone's head. And if you do, you will be sanctioned. And it, I just feel like we're now asking, we're putting a bit more pressure on the referees. If it's going to be a case of it's not that much change, and this is specifically what we're going to do. And in terms of refereeing the pick and go, I mean, that's, mate, we, we had a pick and go on the weekend. The bloke came in head, um, head to knee height, and he went off with a, went off with a head, in, head injury. Uh, so to say that there isn't as much force on a pick and go as there is in a normal tackle, I don't know where that science has come from. I, I would say, do you think that would be a useful uh, exercise is to maybe you submit a game to the RFU or as many clubs can and they go through those games and give, because if, if it's, if it's always, if everything's going to be just two incidents, you're not really far off of what you're doing now. And, and then you'll get more clarity on what are those two incidents, why are they, you know, is that going to be something that the RFU should be looking at to do to try and help help local clubs out? May I kick this off by saying I think the game's as safe now as it's ever been, at community level, for sure. It's cleaner, it's faster, it's more attractive. As Paul said, we take any sort of injury so seriously. We had a young lad on Saturday who had a, had a swollen knee on Thursday, was def desperate to play, and we just said, no, mate, all your rugby's ahead of you, you're not playing. Um, and mate, he'd have made half my tackles for me. I'd have been, I'd have been <laughs> gagging to have him out there, you know. But uh, yeah, I think, I think there are a few need to get down and actually get involved in some community rugby, actually play some, uh, and and see where they're at. Because I know they've had some ex players on the committee, but how close are these people to the game? Because they've got to decide if the balance of making these changes is is enough in terms of impact in the game to get the rewards they want that that's my that's my question we'll offer I'll Bill be... Sweeney a game for Aylesbury Vets next weekend <laughs> make very welcome I'll come, I'll come down and play I'll come yeah. down and play like, we're the <laughs> ones Bill <laughs> sorry John you were about to say something I'll be really interested to see this game played but 
as we as we really get into on this, it hasn't seemed to be thought through yet that the, the full extent of what the nuance is against what we were told last week. So, but it would be really interesting to see a game played at, at these with these, these new laws, so, uh, these new laws introduced. That's a good. That, that's a really, to see what it looks like. That's a really good point, Paul. That, that I think the RFU have to then put sort of some of the well, I mean, even the French games, the different tiers of French rugby, going all the way down from. I assume it goes to, from to just the, under uh, Pro de Deux, does it? Yeah, I think the Ligue just, uh, or something like that. Uh, yeah, uh, Ligue 1. From, <laughs> and put one game of each so you, people can see what it looks like. Because I think I think the biggest problem I've had with it is my, I'm caught between what I see now at Minch playing and watch, watching them to also what I've experienced for, um, well, playing 18 years at top level. And I just see the negatives I'll be honest with you. That's that's just how I am. I see the athletes in <coughs> professional sport. If I'm trying to tackle around waist all the time, how good that some people are stepping laterally. I'm thinking I'm going to get my head the wrong side more times than I'm going to get it on the right side because if someone steps inside me and I'm already down at that height, there's nothing I can do. My head's going, it's getting knocked off, whatever. But so I think if you could see that, if there were examples out there that were readily ex- available for every club to see, ASAP. I think that would allow coaches to more process what it will look like, how it and and go from there. Obviously, it's going to be now different because you you have still have double tackles and you you've got to imagine that within that. But I think I think vision is the best way of people understanding. I wonder if where this will net out is actually if you think about how much rugby is a game of taking as much as you possibly can. Rugby is essentially how much can I get away with. By lowering the tackle height to the waist and knowing that players will always push the boundaries, you actually end up yeah. with tackles being made in the midriff, which is a much easier way to get to that point than saying to everybody, just tackle the midriff because they'll still push the boundaries up again. But that's that's what I, and I think that's what Bucky's getting at, is that's what we see at, at, at amateur level rugby. We don't see it at, at professional. And I'm thinking this is, it feels like it's more of a reaction to professional problems and it's been forced on the community game. And that, that, that grey area is a problem for the referees. You're going to get referees at our level that anything above the shorts, they're going to penalise because that's their interpretation. Yeah. And you're going to get other referees that are going to give us that, that grey area, gray area around the navel. I mean, we coach leg chopping. We, we coach people to tackle safely. We coach people to go low. Uh, we don't coach people to tackle high. But as, as Tin say, invariably, it's a part of the game. But tackling high isn't always dangerous. Um, it's, 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 it's a necessary tackle technique sometimes it is mate and there's some tackles that's the tackle choice of some people because they can't they can't get low enough to make anything else so that is you know? an interesting point Tins was talking about those people whose gut don't necessarily allow them to drop their <laughs> knees and, and get in on people's there's, knees I mean, there's big front rows in the, yeah, uh, what, in the what lower what percentage league? of the Aylesbury you don't necessarily need to name names but what percentage of the, the charges <laughs> you, you look after are actually going to struggle to make these tackles <laughs> There's going to be um, two or three lads, and I just like every week, leg chop, leg chop, leg chop, and um, they go high, mate. They go high, but they're not dangerous high. They're not dangerous high, but they are. They can look. They're looking for a cuddle, and they are sucking yards out of our gain line, just giving (laughs) up yards. Um, But um, but again, you know, the reality is at community level, if you make a high percentage of your tackles, you're probably going to win the game. Um, But you know, the the game the You've got to allow rugby for all different shapes and sizes. You know, I'm, I coach leg chops, but I've got to accept some lads are always going to go, always going to go um, and look for an upper body shot. But that doesn't mean it's a dangerous tackle. The thing I love most about rugby is every facet of the game is a competition. Whereas hmm. if we push it down to we're basically giving people free offloads, which is ultimately what you're try- what could happen then where does the competition come in that tackle area? The ball carrier has all the all the advantage, always should offload. Are we just going to go end-to-end try? Does that take that competitiveness out of grassroots rugby? I, th- I think if the RFU are doing it because they want to see more offloads, then I think they, what they're going to see is more people jumping into that space to prevent the offload, which is going to lead to more dangerous collisions. Will it change the game? No, I don't. I don't think it's. I think. I think it's just been bad, badly managed. I don't think it's. A, it's a. It's a necessary rule change at our level of the game at this stage. I think what we're doing at the minute is safe enough, and we need to keep going with it and keep 
um, it, educating people around the rules we've got at the minute and the head case staff and looking after people. Um, I, d I don't think we need this rule at the minute. Can we talk about personal responsibility as well? We haven't mentioned that yet. Every player that ran out on Saturday knew, did, went out there knowing there was a risk that they, they could injure themselves. Not just concussion, there's all manner of injuries you can you know, get on a rugby pitch. At what point do you take that away from the players and then force them to play a game the way you want to play it, which probably isn't the way they want to play the game? Let, let me give you the floor. John, John forgive me, because you, you, there may be points that you want to make, John, before we finish this up. But James and Paul, are there questions and points that we have not covered tonight, which you would like to put to John uh, at this point in time? I just that Statistics frustrate me because people seem to be able to make them mean what they want them to mean. Um, I mean, I worked in professional coaching, John, so I played that game as well. Uh, so I just want to see the evidence and I want, it to, I want it clearly explained to me. And if they can say to me that my daughter is going to be 20% safer playing to these rules than she would be playing to the old ones across the board, not just head on head collisions and, and whatever else, then, you know, you, you've got an argument, but then at the same time, as Paul said, people are still signing up for this rule book as it is. And I understand there's been a lot of press around concussions and lawsuits and, and everything else. I understand that. Um, but these, like I said, at the, at the community level, people are choosing to play the game. We've got to where we are now, which seems to be uh, a position was set out last week of what the game was going to go to. Just in this conversation alone, that seems to be changing already. Why why have we got to this point and why was the, the grassroots game not involved in this? Why was it just the council made members making the decision on what I believe was a video they watched on the Zoom call? Why have we got to this point where we're only now getting to ask questions? And and, and not really, the, thanks to John for coming on to this so we can do that. Where, where is the opportunity to, for us to get involved in this, this decision-making process? Because surely we must be. John. The council have debated this at length and th they are all involved in the community game and they're in touch with the community game in, in most cases, Paul. Um, okay. um, again, I, I do think we need to spend more time gathering the views of people like yourself and James in, in the coming weeks and months when we seek to develop these proposals more fully. Um, you know, and, and that is our intent now as well. I, I do believe that some of the changes that we're talking about in terms of slight lowering of the tackle height, I, I do think that those changes will make the game safer. And I think that's an important thing to, to remember because player welfare continues to be a, a, a very challenging topic for, for, for rugby governing bodies across the globe. I'm, I'm, really, I'm just going to say this now, John. I'm really grateful to you for coming on because this is, this is uh, we, we were talking before you guys joined us, actually. This is about the most divisive topic we've had on our show, and I certainly wasn't expecting it a week or so ago. I was actually going to ask you the question around how this has been communicated, whether you have dropped the bomb, so to speak, and then we're going to work back from it, or whether you do have regrets about how this has been communicated. You've already answered that element of it, but do you believe you have got the answers to some of the points that are being shouted about all over social media and have been raised tonight? Have you got the answers to the points that are being made so that you can almost get that narrative back? Or is this going to have to require really quite a big piece of coming together and working through and explaining it in order to get to, I suppose, the buy-in that you're looking for? Yeah, I think some of the areas we've discussed tonight, we, we always knew they would take a little bit of time to refine. So we mentioned the scenario around the, the tackles on, near, on or near the goal line, the pick and go scenarios, etc. So we understood that that would take a little bit of time to refine in terms of how that's written into law and more importantly, how those laws become law guidelines that referees can use and, and coaches can refer to as well. Um, so clearly that's one area. And then the other area, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons why the decision was making, made so early is we were very keen that it would give time to develop a, a training package, a support package for the game over the, over the next few months. Because as James has mentioned, you know, changing techniques and developing players takes a little bit of time. So we want to give the game as much time as possible to adapt and, and, and ready themselves for next season. And, and there will be some consultation, bef you know, 
as part of building that support package and obviously delivering that over the spring, summer months and into and beyond next season. So with that in mind, would it might not have made more sense to start at the top of the game where they've got the money and the coaching structures to implement this properly and, and as, it, as it needs to be, rather than the bottom of the game where we'll do our best? I think, I think the, one of the challenges, Paul, is that elite competition is it, it sits under the remit of, of, of world rugby rather than rather than the, the RFU or the SRU or whoever. So hence the reason why this is at the moment applied to the domestic game in, in England. Do you think that do you think this will arrive at, at that level eventually? Because at the minute we've got a situation where uh, and w- which which does happen our our under fourteens I think go and play in Wales on tour. Yeah. Whether that can't happen this year because they play a different game. Or next season, maybe one. So, so we, we we have been in conversation with the with the other home unions, and 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 they are discussing discussing what we've been talking about this evening, uh, and we're also aware that World Rugby are considering this from a from a community game perspective across the globe as well, in terms of a, a lowering of the tackle height. Um, so we, we are aware those conversations are happening and have been happening for a while. I'm I, I'm only laughing because I'm just wondering why you didn't all announce it together. I'm very brave of the RFU to sort of lead the charge. I mean, certainly the article we read suggested that the WRU, IRFU and SRU are going to be following in the not, not too, too distant future. Can, can I just quickly ask you, John, have you been surprised by, I suppose, the volatility of the reaction to the announcement last week? Yeah, if I'm honest, a little bit, yeah. Um, but then I, I put myself in the shoes of when I was playing the game, you know, a what? I suspect that I may have reacted the same way initially. And then when I've thought more about it, you know, I've looked at it, you know, what's happened over the last 20 years, the tackle heights have gradually got a little bit higher, you know, across all levels of the game. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that in terms of how the tackle and how defences are coached. So, but then I thought again, I thought, what, you know, what's the main, you know, what are the main tackle areas that, that you would want your players to target if you were coaching them? You'd want them to tackle around the thighs and, and around the waist in, in most cases, which, you know, um, so I, I, I can understand the reaction. I, I hope a little bit of time allows for a little bit, you know, cooler heads and, and people think about where they were taught to tackle, and how they were taught to tackle and, and, and how that can be a, a more common occurrence in the game in the future. You know, those waist high and, and thigh tackles. I've, I've got a question. I don't know whether there's going to be an answer to it. In the fact uh, that a discussion that I was having with Alex earlier, why rugby union? Why is rugby league still sticking to what it does? Who, where all this technique that you're talking about has mainly come from the likes of Sean Edwards coming in and putting press defences in off the line, get up as fast as you can, which has built that challenge to the the race to close the space, which keeps you upright for longer. Um, but yet they're not concerned about it. The, the fight game three of origin, three people went off with head knocks in the first five minutes. You know, you still see those massive, um, you know, contacts off first kickoffs. Yet we seem to be the only ones really Democrat. looking looking to be doing the right thing and not. And my worry is we haven't identified what we are as a sport and what we are as a brand. Where do we set? Where do we draw that line in the sand of going? The rest of it is the sport. It is a It is attritional. You know, a test match is called a test match because it is a test of character, not just skill, and. Uh, and fitness and everything else. It's a test of who you are, whether you compare it to being a gladiator or not in, in the stage and the cauldron. You know, a lot of the time the stadiums are called cauldrons. Are we changing our game to keep a trying, certain... Trying to be all things to all uh, men. Yeah, we're trying to be... To yeah, are we trying to be all things to all men rather than going, this is what it is to be a rugby player and this is our game. If you want to play it, come and play it. Or if you don't, don't. I mean, we we already lose age grade players to rugby league Do because you? it's a summer, yeah, because it's a summer sport. So we'll lead, we'll lose them for parts of the season to go and play rugby league because of the overlap. Um, and I'm just thinking, like, obviously we, you know, we're 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 in the south, but in the north, those lads that want to go and get that have that physical contest, it's an easy decision for them to cross the cross the boundary, isn't it? No, sure. I don't disagree. Can I ask you that? Because I'm mean, conscious we could we could do this for a lot longer. And I think, I mean, honestly, if we can help broker and navigate some of this, it would be like an episode of well, think, Jerry Springer. I think trying I think to bring we, all parties I think together. We're, we're going to walk away in James's prob- J- uh, Bucky and and Paul are probably in a better place than what. Well, that, they that was my question, really. I mean, has this alleviated 
any of your concerns, James, in any way, shape or form. There is going to be a dialogue. There is going to be a sort of a working party to help you guys do what you've got to do. There's more to come. There is more to come. Or do you leave this conversation with very little gained? I I just want to say thanks to John for sticking his head up and taking some shots, really. Um, I I, I feel for you, John. because I feel like, I feel like you're you're wearing it for 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 the union, um, that it hasn't been well communicated, and you and it has frustrated a lot of rugby union players throughout the country. So there needs to then you I think there needs to be a step back, and you need to come and speak to us. You need to consult us. We need to be part of the process. Um, and we all want a safe game, but we still want a game of rugby. And I think yeah. I think that's the key. Paul. Uh, the same as James has just said, really, that the, the, the reason the, the the reaction to this has been as it has is because of the way it was delivered. And I say, it's already what we're hearing is that the it's been softened already by the sounds of it to, to, to be more palatable. Um, so, so perhaps perhaps we'll, we'll we'll get to where we need to get to. But um, what what we were told last week um, didn't sit well. I I was at the club all day Saturday and all night, and it's all we talked about all day long. And because what was sent out. The conversations were completely negative. I think there's not one person said, "Well, hang on, it might make sense to do this." Not one person said that, and then we had a few people down. So it, it, the reaction is is as it is because of the way it was delivered. So perhaps going forward now, we, we make some ground over the next few days. Um, but it doesn't sound like there's much time to do it. John, so sort of final summing up for you, really. I mean, it's it's been fed back pretty clearly that it hasn't been very well communicated and you have very kindly sort of put your head up, uh, as we said, and, and accepted some of that. Give us a sort of a, a sense of what is next? How, how are you going to get the narrative back on this? And, and what is the end point that you'd like people to hear from your good self as to why this is being done and, and, and where why this is necessary? If I, st- if I start, we- we've all been around the block a little bit in terms of our rugby lives. So introducing new laws into rugby always comes with a period of transition. Um, and some of those are more accepted than others. I appreciate this is a this is a seismic change. It, 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 and we, we, we can see that from the reaction. I understand that. Um, I also, you know, through my own experience in the game, I recognise that, you know, People in the game do come together to try and find a solution that works for the, for the majority as well, and and hopefully that can begin to happen now. Um, you know, with the likes of James and Paul and others, we we can find a solution that that we can all move forward with. And then I guess the the final piece for me, I pick up something James says. You know, there's there's no intention to try and make the game less physical, James. You know, we we. You know, all of us involved in the game admire the physical qualities of the people that play the game and want the game to stay physical. Um, we, we are just looking at trying to find ways to minimise that concussion risk, especially those that are caused by certain types of tackles and the ones that Tins just described there. And I guess my final piece is that, you know, sometimes the change does take a couple of years. We've got to be patient with this. You know, we've seen that you often get re- rejection and, shall we say, grudging acceptance in years one and two. And then over time, you know, people become more confident and comfortable with what's been, what's been, what's been changed. And, uh, and, you know, you move forward again to the next stage, you know, the next evolution of the game. Sounds a bit like my dating game, that rejection for two years. And then <laughs> hopefully it comes on through. Just, I'm gonna, just two, <laughs> just two. Still trying. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, fellas. Um, this is for you mainly, James and Paul. Th- this actually... It was feedback from a conversation that the RFU have had with the FFR. So obviously they implemented these laws in 2019. I I went through them a bit earlier on. I'm just going to pick out a couple of them. It was a very difficult start, slightly confused by COVID, but after two full years of implementation, there is no further discussion on the topic. So in France, these are now bedded in and everyone's accepted them. Uh, Also, they've looked at 50 games recently and compared pre and post rates of head impacts, concussion, yellow cards, and they say the numbers are vastly reduced. They are waiting for the quantitative data. And just a final one, in summary, the FFR are 100% satisfied with the initiative. They have reduced injury rates and created a better game with more continuity. Does that leave you with hope? Or do you remain sceptical, James? I I need to... to I need to see it. I need to play it. I'm not following anything on paper. Okay, fair point. So if 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 the RFU put those uh, some games at uh, levels of what is happening in France, would you watch them? And would you see? Would you would you Go like on. to see what it looks like? 
Well, I think that would be a very good idea. I think that's all part of the consultation, isn't it? That we haven't had. There we are, John. Can we get a couple of games and we'll stick them up on goodbadrugby.com and rfu.com and people can come and see what the new what the new regime looks like? I thought we were going to have a trip over to France for a moment. I thought that was the idea. <laughs> if you're well, paying, we'll, we will. We'll, yeah. we'll, 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 exactly. Well, I think, I think that, needs to, that needs to be supported with clear directives from the RFU. Are we fully following what they're doing to the letter or are, or are there mild adaptations? Because, uh, you know, the, it's the interpretation and, uh, of the laws that has always been the issue with rugby. Yeah. And That's how, right, how, how, how much grey area is there going to be? Let's get this form of the game nailed down then and what it's going to end up as, because we don't still have to be, seem to be entirely sure what we're going to end up with. But let's get to there. And then you're welcome. You can have the pitch at, uh, well, it's the RFUs, but you can have the pitch at Aylesbury and, uh, and we'll put a game on and we'll watch how it's ref and how it's played and see if it's doable or not. But Tins versus the, Hans we still don't know what it is. That's a very good question, actually, John. Why have you not just taken the directives from France and implemented those? Why is there a difference? I guess we were mindful of the reaction that we might have got if we'd have said that, 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 <laughs> that went well. in all situ- <laughs> in all situations the ball carrier must stay upright. You know, we felt there was enough scope that w- that would allow the ball carrier to brace for contact um, and still allow a lower tackle area. So that that was the first thing, and we also we we recognise that the the pick and drive is is a really you know key part of the community game. And we wanted to try and discover if we could maintain that as as, as part of the game. I, I when I first heard about the the upright running, I thought of a drill that Larder did once, where you had to run around holding a ball above your head um, with your ribs fully exposed, and you had Danny Grukot tr- with a free license to maim you. But when men were men. <laughs> literally five people were crawling <laughs> off the pitch. So that's what, that's what I originally had in my head, is the fact that you're just running completely bolt upright with, <laughs> and just getting filled in left, right, and centre. So stick that in your notebook, John. We'll have that as a directive <laughs> in 2025, all right? Ball must be carried above head at all times. Um, listen, I, once again, are... I'm very grateful to you for, for coming out, and, and it, it's not been an easy 72, whatever it is, hours for the RFU. You, so we are very grateful. Can I just ask you, John? Do you do you think we're going to get there with this, or is I mean the state of the noise now and the way the world is, is this going to have to sort of go through another iteration? Uh, I don't know about iteration. I think it will evolve. I think we will get there. Um, I, I call me a bit of a romantic. I'm a great believer in the game and the people in the game, and I think you know we will come together and find a you know a, a solution to this. I, and move things forward. Good. Come together, I think, might be the key words that Paul latches onto. Thank you very much, Steve, for your time. James, what's the big game this weekend? Aylesbury against who, where? What's at stake? Uh, London Cornish. London Cornish. Nice. How are you yeah. tracking over all this season? Where are we, where are we sat? Sixth? Yeah. Yeah, we just, we had yeah. Hammers, we had Hammers and Fullers, Hammersmith and Fulham on um, on Saturday, top of the league. Uh, we just kicked them a bit too much counter attack. They were sharp in the back line. Really? Um, yeah, and we were just too tight around the breakdown, mate. We didn't get enough width, so they they cut us apart a few times. Good. And who is player of the season so far? Who gets a shout out? Oh, mate. I'll nominate yourself. No, no. Uh, oh, <laughs> who are we going for? Oh, uh, John T. Charlie. Yeah. Good boy. Uh, the, the, yeah, yeah. Right. He's mate. The kid. Last week we we're playing OPs, and there's four fifty-fifty kick chases he's had he's got no right to any of them scored all four wow so and he makes his tackles mate can't fault him below the waist i hope below the waist i hope chop 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 post match curry this week is uh, uh post match curry this week uh vicky's no idea, just... little he had, his, yeah. <laughs> he had his sweet and sour chicken on last week that's my favorite it goes down well delicious Good luck to you for the rest of the season. We had such a great week, uh, um, evening with you uh, a few months ago. It's great to see community it was great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. just the great work that you are. So long may that continue. John, once again, many thanks. Thank I you, John. I hope they'll give you tomorrow off off the back of the fire you've taken today. So uh, <laughs> we really appreciate your time and well your thoughts. Then. And hopefully for everybody's sake, we can find our way back to a middle ground where there are more smiles than frustrations. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Go forth and conquer. Thank you. And there they go. Not Often we play the role of peacekeepers and negotiators and deal brokers. Have we taken a bit of the sting out of it? I I generally think we have. I think I sit in a better place now than what I did before. I'm slightly confused how it's got to the point where they've just dropped the bomb without 
you know what Paul and Bucky said without really any consultation and any explanation. Yeah, you know, I, I took uh, heart out the fact that Bucky said that they had looked at a game and there were only two incidents. So it means that it's not two, two incidents, which under the new directives, new directives would, have would, would have been penalties. penalties. Yeah. So it's not um, it's not a massive landscape change by the sounds of things now. Yeah. Uh, to what it, and it's sort of, sort of what I what I, we were talking about before. I didn't think it was going to be a massive. But it seems to be like it's almost what's happening in the professional game. Let's just put it in the community game. Let's solve the prefer, but it's it's not actually an issue. Which yeah. I think it was a lot of the angst and the fire that was coming out of social media yesterday was the fact that it wasn't needed. Yeah, either John has played about the greatest game of bluff I've ever seen, or inadvertently, I think the RFU, by napalming the situation and then working back, adding in the nuance, etc. I think that is actually a more effective way of getting what they want out of it than trying to get people to edge their tackle heights down. Because everything now feels like a win for the community game, whereas the community yeah, yeah. game will grumble and moan as it as it's gently tapered away. So I would be very interested to see where it all nets out. I think we should offer to the RFU, we could do a live webinar and they can bring whoever they want from the RFU. We'll get as many people in from the community game and we'll make it a sort of a news night. Bill, check your inbox. Bill, in email incoming. A um, couple of bits before we go. Thank you once again, particularly to John for coming. Always, okay, but, but, but um, James speaks very well, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, should be our community agent, actually. Uh, and thank you to Paul. We did have a very good time at Aylesbury, so uh, it is great to see good clubs doing good things. Uh, this week, we got we had quite a lively lock-in. What did we talk about? Uh, yep, so we were on to uh, my Australia trip. Another, Chris Hemsworth. Another one. Yeah. Chris Hemsworth. Chris. Donk. Oh, hello, sailor. How good looking? Uh, yeah, yeah, you definitely would. Right. Um, uh, then we were on, oh, yeah, uh, Bearded Dragons. Not a euphemism. Not a euphemism. And then me and Hask's poor impersonation of Bo and Luke Duke <laughs> and the Honda. HRV. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure Honda will be back for more, but it was lovely to work with them on the one-off that we have so far. That is on this week's Lock-In, exclusively through Apple. Please do uh, get involved in that and let us know your thoughts as well. We'd love to hear from you. Merch is always on the website for the super fans. Make sure you tune in next week as well because we are launching an exciting new prediction game ahead of the Six Nations, where you can take on Hask, Tins and myself. Highly competitive, it will be. More details to follow. Uh, the Good, the Bad and the Rugby this week is produced by Connor Hewitt and is a folding pocket production. Look after yourselves. We're back in seven days' time. Bye for now. <laughs>